Hello, everyone, and welcome to the State of the Academy Address. It is my privilege to serve as McMaster's Provost and Vice President Academic. I want to thank all of you for welcoming me to this role. From the moment I said yes, I felt like part of this community. Working with all the members of the community, but especially those that I work closest to, Provost Council, the Provost Office, and the PVP group. I would also like to specifically acknowledge President David Farrar for his trust in me and his steady and thoughtful leadership through this very, very unique time. I am actually speaking to you today from main campus, beautiful University Hall where my office is located. The last year and a half has been demanding, full of change, strenuous and uncertain. For me personally, it has been challenging interesting and transformative. Like many of you, I have lost loved ones and seen firsthand how the pandemic has affected how we live, how we learn, how we work, and how we function. Whoever would have guessed that going to the grocery store would be an outing. It has also though brought positive changes. We've reimagined how we teach and learn, how we live, how we do research. It has also brought new meaning to many aspects of life that we probably never thought a lot about before. And for me, it has really reinforced how important community is, and more specifically highlighted what a great community McMaster is. It is collaborative, it is caring, it is compassionate, and it is agile. So today, my goal is to speak to you about where we are, and where we're going. We won't be able to cover everything in, the, in this time period that we share together, but I'll do my best to cover as many questions as I can. So I'm now going to share my screen as we do in Zoom. And here we go. So I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so basically, uh, where I want to start is acknowledging that although we are gathering virtually, McMaster University stands on the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga nations and is protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about McMaster by the numbers. I'm going to talk about our academic planning. I'm going to talk about where we are going, and I'm also going to share some special Mac moments that have been shared with me. And then finally, we're going to open the floor for questions from the community. So first of all, where are we now? Well, I have to start by saying our incoming students and our student population are outstanding. We are in an enviable position where we do attract outstanding students across all six of our faculties in all our various programs. It's also exciting to note that people want to come here. Applications have risen 21% over the last four years. And what we're finding is our students are more focused than ever on learning and making a difference. They want to pursue high high level experiential learning opportunities, they want to have opportunities to go out into the world and make a difference. If we look at our undergraduate student population, you can see it has grown substantially over the last several years. We have about 15% international students um, in our student population at the undergraduate level. At the graduate level, we've also seen some growth over our period and a real stabilization. Our international students in the fall of 2020 were about 25% of our population. And many of our students are coming from all over the world. We have over 120 countries represented in our student population. In terms of our faculty complement, we have 994 full-time faculty and 95% of those faculty hold doctoral degrees. I just want to acknowledge how much our faculty have done. They have, they have faced challenges in terms of teaching. They've switched to remote teaching. They've done impactful research 
that is really making a difference. And of course, they've, they've supported all of our students on this journey. So thank you very much. I know many of you have been tackling hard problems every day for the last year and a half. Thank you. They've also had great success in terms of research. As you know, we are the most research intensive institution in Canada, and we're very proud of that. Our numbers continue to grow. I am so grateful to be able to collaborate with our Vice President Research, Dr. Karen Mossman and her team to really support the research entity in my role as provost. And lastly, but certainly not least, Thank you to our staff. We have approximately 8,500 employees as of July, 2021. And this excludes many of our clinical faculty and temporary casual staff. Um, we'll, what we also see is that people want to stay with our organization. We have been named Hamilton Niagara's top employers now for the past seven years. And this is really important because it allows us to recruit and retain our high quality staff who contribute greatly to the academy and the overall operation of the institution. So let's turn to one of my favorite subjects, academic planning. And of course, a big part of my role as chief academic officer and chief budget officer is to look at how we're allocating our resources and ensuring that in everything we do, we are directing our efforts towards high quality research, high quality teaching and learning, and high quality student experience. So I wanted to start by saying that everything we have done is it has been under the umbrella of a planning decision framework. And this framework has been something that has, we've had in place since the very beginning of the pandemic. And we've had some alterations to it as we've come through the pandemic, but certainly it has been a tremendous um, framework for us to work on. And so I just wanted to take a moment to really reinforce how we were making decisions throughout this time period. So first and foremost, we were directing ourselves to deliver academic on deliver on our academic and research mission to prioritize health and safety and well being of all our community members, including, of course, our students, staff, and faculty. We remain focused on student success. We are directing our efforts to deliver high quality learning environments and outstanding student experience. And we are also welcoming all of our community members back to campus safely. This, of course, means that we're following public health guidelines and government protocols. We are supporting plans to deliver all of our programs. We support our students, we're supporting learning and research, and we're really directing ourselves towards enhancing McMaster's sense of community. This is a really important part of who we are and ensuring that we have the culture that values the community that we have. It's about supporting flexible arrangements that strengthen the ability for people to contribute to the success of McMaster. We've learned a lot during the pandemic. We've learned that we can deliver our work hybrid. And so how do we retain some of these very important lessons learned while ensuring that we do maintain a strong and vibrant presence on campus. We also have supported research excellence, and this is research excellence across all our faculties, and really supporting our researchers in all disciplines to really advance creativity, innovation, and impact. And impact is extremely important in everything that we do. You know, we've also really been conscientious about upholding our university values, our principles and policies. We really are focused on inclusivity, accommodation, respect for one another, and really uh, it's important that we have a collegial decision-making process. 
certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, we had to react to a lot of things that we simply weren't used to reacting to. But I'm very proud of the fact that we were very um, conscientious and really deliberate about ensuring that we were following our university practices and policies and really getting back to the way that we make decisions um, and following those practices and protocols. Um, it's also important to say that we have continued to make fiscally prudent decisions to support our ongoing stability and success as an institution, and that means balancing risk and opportunity. You know, it's extremely important that whenever we enter into any discussion that we do look at the risks and also the opportunities. Um, we can't shy away from opportunities. There will be risks present, but being very thoughtful and strategic and again, deliberate about what kinds of things that we value and what kinds of initiatives we support. And then finally, really to work together to support all of our community across the institution and ensure information plans and decisions are communicated clearly and promptly. For those of you that participated in the summer town halls, you'll know that it was very important for us throughout this process to try to be transparent, to try to be clear. And if there's one thing I've learned over the last year and a half, we cannot over communicate. We make the commitment that we'll do our best to always share what we're thinking and how we're planning for the future. I also wanted to really highlight what was unique, I think, about our approach. And for me, it was really an operation that was a collaborative operation that really enabled people from across campus to participate. So we started planning in the, uh, to come back in the fall of 2021 in February of 2021. We knew it was going to be important, we knew it was going to be complex, and we knew we needed to really think about how we were going to manage. At the same time, we, we had to guesstimate where we were going to be. Fortunately, at McMaster, we have experts from across campus who could assist us, and this was both our, our research faculty, but also our very high quality and high performing professional staff. Um, initially, we set up a COVID-19 expert committee that actually provided us advice. And these are experts in virology, immunology, medicine, statistics, uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, humanities experts from across campus who really understood the problem from a research perspective and helped guide us so that when we were thinking about coming back to campus, that we would do it safely with health and safety as our top priority. Um, in terms of other working groups, we had a research and innovation working committee that made sure that we were balancing all the risks with all the opportunities supporting our researchers, access funding, making sure that our students could continue on their programs, that they could have those hands-on experiences and really be impactful. In terms of our workplace and exp employee experience group, this was a very wide ranging group from across the institution to start to really talk about how we were gonna come back to campus and who needed to be on campus and what kinds of protocols needed to be in place so that we could do that effectively with the mission of always making sure that we were true to our university core values and also that we could deliver on our academic and research mission. And of course, teaching and learning and student experience. This is core to what we do. And it was very important that we thoughtfully looked at all the information we had in front of us so that we could come back to campus safely. It was actually very important to us to bring our students back, to have them be part of this community, not only virtually, but physically here on campus with us. So we did a number of important um, activities that really were directed at setting our students up for success. And so again, I wish I could spend more time with you this afternoon to talk about the many initiatives. I've just taken a moment to select a few today. 
The Archway program has been an extremely important program that connects incoming students, incoming first year McMaster students with a paid mentor. It develops a sense of belonging. It provides individualized support. It helps students navigate McMaster's resources and systems. I also wanted to remind the audience that if you do have questions for me, to please submit them using the Slido platform, um, because then that way uh, they'll be in the queue for answering later. We also set up students for success, uh, looking at academic skills and offering services for our students to develop critical learning, learn how to do research, how to manage their time and writing skills. And we started these, uh, these uh, programs in the summer. There were summer writing programs. There were academic skills prep series. There were undergraduate uh, peer tutoring sessions. And of course, our welcome week was a great success. Just under 40% of our activities were actually hosted in person. And we also hosted activities for both our second year class because of course they were not on campus um, for uh, the 2020-2021 academic year. And of course our incoming 2021-2022 uh, students. Um, for our graduating students, um, we set up various resources. What we do know about our graduating students is they're highly sought after. McMaster grads, um, ha have uh, many opportunities presented to them because it is recognized that what they're learning here is valuable. Um, but of course, many of our students have had financial concerns because of COVID-19 impacts on personal and family finances. So we're really working hard to support them. And what else is really interesting is most of our students now are really more open to non-traditional ways into the workforce. So this could mean startups, it could mean entrepreneurial, it could be not-for-profit, you name it. They're going everywhere and we're so proud of them, but we're also here to support them. Um, one of the really critical pieces to our, our coming back to campus and certainly as part of our planning process was our vaccination mandate. We did have an announcement in August, August the 16th. I remember that day well, uh, when we came out with our mandatory vaccination policy. And this was really an important step for us. It was a step that we took very carefully. We sought advice. We had communicated broadly with various leaders across campus, including MUFA, but also other groups on campus. And the, it was really important to us that we introduce this as part of our health and safety policies. And it really came into full effect on October the 18th. And this was also important because we gave our community the opportunity to have that time frame to get vaccinated if they had not been vaccinated prior to that point in time. I am very proud to say that more than 99% of our faculty 96% of our students and 96% of our staff were fully vaccinated by the deadline. Of course, we're further down the track, we're a month later and those numbers are even higher. But I do think it was an important signal that our community stepped up and I wanna thank you. Um, we did many things on campus. You'll see we had a vaccine pop-up clinic for our students that was, uh, well received, it was convenient. Um, and throughout the pandemic, we provided those kinds of supports to them. We also had a very rigorous process in place for assessing our human rights exemptions. Again, this was a very well thought out process that involved a number of professionals where we sought advice to really handle these appropriately. We also had COVID testing on campus. So here's a few photos from the asymptomatic testing center that's located in Musk. Uh, we also had symptomatic testing uh, on campus. And so you might say, what are the numbers looking like? Well, again, we really were directing our policies and practices towards keeping our community safe. I am very proud and pleased to say, and I am touching wood here, that we only had eight reported cases on campus since September 2021, 
and we have not had any outbreaks at McMaster. And I truly believe that this is a sign of our community's commitment to health and safety. And I do think it has a lot to do with our mandatory vaccine policy. So you might be wondering, where are we going? Well, what to expect in winter 2022? We have a lot of excitement um, as we come back to campus for even more hands-on learning and in-person collaboration. Um, we'll have many, many study and meeting spaces available and services and supports. I said this before, we can't wait to have you back on campus. And I can truly tell you, all of us are so looking forward to seeing everyone back on campus. So one of the other really exciting um, activities that I am, of course, very involved in, but of course, under our leadership of President Farrar, is supporting McMaster's strategic plan. And to me, this is uh, this will continue to transform our organization in many ways. And there are really five critical areas that we're focusing in on and teaching and learning, engaging local, national, indigenous and global communities, operational excellence, inclusive excellence and research and scholarship. Um, I think all of these areas represent a unique opportunity for us to really reimagine education and reimagine how we actually do all our work across campus. So firstly, partnered in teaching and learning is really about partnered and interdisciplinary learning. This is another really key differentiator for McMaster. We have a long tradition of interdisciplinarity activities in our teaching and learning spaces. And it's really important. It's important that our students have exposure to the different disciplines so that when they get out in the world, they can handle those technically complex problems. It really is about inclusive excellence and scholarly teaching. So it's about teaching as a profession. It's about caring about pedagogy. It's about delivering our curriculum in new and innovative ways. Um, it's really about holistic and personalized student experiences. So as I spoke to before, from the time our students arrive on campus, we're really trying to give them those opportunities that they can grow. It's about active and flexible learning spaces. So this enables our instructors to be creative in how they are delivering our um, curriculum and how we're teaching our learners. It's also about our learners as partners. So it's not just that they're sitting there, they're actually partners on this journey. Um, in terms of our Black Excellence Cohort Hiring Initiative, this has been also a wonderful opportunity for us to welcome um, members uh, from the Black Excellence uh, Cohort Group to our community. And I can tell you, I have had the pleasure and opportunity to meet many of our new colleagues and just so excited about them coming to campus. So we are well on track. We made the commitment that we would hire 12 new colleagues. So as part of the, the formal process, um, we have eight are hired already. We have four hires in progress. And I'd like to say that several of the faculties, in addition to the, the um, two colleagues that were coming in under uh, the provost initiative, we have several others who will be joining us. This has been a tremendous success. I can tell you that there are many other institutions across Canada who are trying to copy us now on this very important and strategic initiative. In addition, I've had the true pleasure of working with our colleagues um, through the GJAC group, which is all about um, uh, discussing jointly a lot of the matters uh, related to Indigenous research and education, Indigenous student experience 
Strategies and Leadership and Governance. We are very excited that on Orange Shirt Day, an Indigenous Strategic Direction um, initiative had been launched. And now we're really excited to actually start to implement many of those activities. I think it's also gonna be transformational. We have much to learn in this space and I am really excited about working with colleagues across campus to deliver on the strategic direction initiatives. Um, another really important activity that happens under the provost umbrella is the strategic alignment funding program. And this has been a program that over the years has allowed us to pursue different strategic opportunities in the academy. And so some of these, just to name a few, have involved community engaged learning, intercession courses, and new interdisciplinary programs. Um, there are other programs such as MAC experts and many, many other programs that have been funded under this program. And the idea is that seed funds are put in towards different types of initiatives to really enhance um, you know, what we're doing in the academy. Sometimes it's actually to try something new. And a lot of times it actually results in changing the way that we're operating. And sometimes we might try something and maybe it's not what we expected. And so I think that's important. You know, if we want to be innovative in everything we do, we need to have the opportunity to try different things. And, and I think that for me, the strategic alignment funding program really allows us to do that. It allows us to do it in a thoughtful way. And, you know, everything we try isn't going to necessarily be perfect, but it's a great learning opportunity. And it's important that we lead by being innovative and trying new things in all matters of the academy. Certainly another important priority is ensuring that we're caring for mental health and well-being at MAC. And really what this is all about is creating a psychologically healthy, inclusive, and accessible university which promotes and supports the mental health and well-being of every member of our community. So every student, staff, and faculty member in all of its activities and creates the conditions for all to flourish. Um, I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity to work with members of the Okanagan Charter. Um, we've had great leadership um, through Paul, Dr. Paul O'Byrne, but also through Dr. Catherine Munn and Dr. Lynn Armstrong. I know that through Throughout this process, over 180 people had been engaged to provide input. It's an important matter for us. It's something that we need to take care of. And I can tell you that we are absolutely committed to ensuring that we do promote um, healthy workplaces and healthy study places. I want to switch gears here for a moment because if there's one thing that's impressed me over the last year and a half, is the contributions that have been made by all levels of people within this organization. So I did take a moment to reach out to get some input on some of our proud Mac moments. I will caveat this by saying that this is just a small sample of all the Mac moments. So I wanted to start with our, with our McMaster University Library. So since the pandemic, they have really focused on enriching library content services to support remote learners and remote instructors. They've added 600,000 eBooks and 20,000 streaming videos. Unbelievable. When I saw those numbers, I thought, wow. They have served up content in multiple ways, everything from the Javi Trust to curbside pickup and various other mechanisms. They've pivoted key services, including research help, classroom instruction, webinars. Um, and, and this has been a tricky piece, um, as our instructors well know, to all of a sudden overnight go to online. They've introduced many new e-services, including e-reserves. They have, since the beginning of this semester, they've reopened the physical libraries and they're back up to operating regular hours to serve our communities. 
And they've really effectively and efficiently transitioned to hybrid delivery of content and services for both in-person and remote learners. Our McMaster Museum of Art has continued to be a force of nature. They have um, pandemic programs and initiatives. They have many online education programs, uh, public art commissions, on-site and virtual exhibitions. Um, they have a special BIPOC curatorial mentorship program. Um, they ran an institutional decolonial boot camp um, and had many exhibitions, which is really amazing to think that, again, going from being all in person to actually offering this kind of programming. Certainly, I would say it was great foresight to many, uh, I believe a year and a half before the pandemic start to actually get queued up to host Immune Nations, the vaccine project, which is currently still in the museum, museum and it is the first debut of this exhibit in Canada. Um, the Remix Project which looked, at, looked at contemporary collage and black futures which is a virtual exhibition. The SUMA 2021 quick, oh, I don't know how to say that correctly. So I'm sure I should have uh, practiced that with Carol, um, which is the McMaster BFA graduating exhibition online. And then we also had a multi-site arts project across Hamilton and online. So again, you know, we've been using our resources to really effectively deliver on our missions. I'm going to move to the faculties, and I would say I have so enjoyed working with all of our faculty deans, our DOFAs, our faculty members, and students. Uh, this is really something that I take great pride and joy in my role as provost. So the DeGroote School of Business is well on track um, to with their construction. They are building the McLean Center for Collaborative Discovery, and it is the future home of DSB on main campus. It features 10 stories with experiential learning labs and student service areas, as well as dedicated spaces for undergraduates to interact with PhDs, faculty, and visiting scholars. Um, they have had uh, $3.5 $3 million worth of gifts from various donors, for innovative student spaces and experiential learning opportunities. The Faculty of Engineering has introduced um, the largest transformation of McMaster's engineering curriculum since the faculty started. It's called the Pivot. If you don't know what it is, I highly recommend you take a look at the engineering website. It's a first year project based course. It's about experiential learning. It's about classroom learning. It's about preparing our graduates to go out and solve those technically complex problems. It's an integrated cornerstone design project and all first year students participated as a blending learning experience. And this started last year in the middle of the pandemic. The Faculty of Health Science, they, when the pandemic hit, as many of you are aware, there were concerns with the AstraZeneca Oxford COVID vaccine because of the very rare side effect of blood clotting. McMaster's platelet immunology laboratory quickly became the only place in Canada where the condition could be diagnosed. Public Health Agency of Canada has announced funding to designate this lab as a national center for excellence in combating vaccine related blood clots. I'd also like to say that our our Nexus Global Initiative is one of the key research initiatives across campus. It is truly an initiative that is covering all of campus and we have people participating. And really the idea is how do we leverage our expertise to not only solve the, the several and various challenges that are coming out of this pandemic, but how we prepare for the next one. The Faculty of Humanities, um, one great example of the many things that are happening in that faculty is the Participedia. It's the global platform for participatory democracy received uh, types of research. And, and this research is really out of the Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice, led by our colleague, um, Professor Bonnie Ipua. And this is really a substantial and important initiative. 
Um, certainly, we know what's happening around the world with respect to um, democratic societies. And I think this initiative is so important that we're playing a key role in ensuring that we're working with our international colleagues. Um, that includes researcher, educators, practitioners, and policymakers who really use open access crowdsourcing platforms and that we're sharing our information and research about those grassroots, grassroots democratic uh, initiatives around the world. The Faculty of Science, um, one of their MAC moments to highlight is the diverse student team, which is helping them operationalize the Faculty of Science new strategic plan. The team was recruited by the Dean's office. It's worked on several key projects this summer. The students continue to work on key initiatives, including how to incorporate Indigenous knowledge, wisdom, and culture into course curriculum. It's, it's already been involved in creating new initiatives in career and cooperative education, and really identifying equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and highlighting gaps that we currently have in teaching and research. The Faculty of Social Science in May of 2021 introduced a Master of Public Policy in Digital Society, and it welcomed its new class at that time, its inaugural class. It was designed to address implications of digital technology, including all aspects of policymaking. It is the first specialized Master of Public Policy degree to be offered in Canada. It's an intensive, 12 month program involving a mix of traditional graduate seminars and it's co-taught by faculty members and practitioners. So what I wanna to say to you is thank you. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Thank you for allowing me to present a little bit of all the great activities that have been happening on our campus. And what I'd like to do now is open it up for questions from the community. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here for a moment. And I am going to um, start with some of the questions that we've received here. And the first, oh, and I'm just making sure I'm queued up here, um, that uh, I'll start with the first question. I'm balancing a few things here. So I am going to try my best to take a live question first, and I have a couple other questions that have been submitted. So the live question I have is, will there be changes to MAC check screening, vaccine requirements, or distancing policy in the winter? So what I want to be clear about is that our vaccine policy will remain in place for the winter term, and we're not anticipating it to go away anytime soon. Everyone coming to campus for the winter term will need to complete the MAC check um, daily, and we're not anticipating that this will go away in the foreseeable future. Um, also, in terms of um, the requirements, there will be no uh, distancing requirements um, uh, required in our instructional spaces, but masking will be required for a period of time. And I just wanna say the health and safety of the community will remain a top priority. And we will continue to evaluate um, our approach as more information is available, but we would really be working, um, we would really be working closely as we have throughout the pandemic with public health and of course our government partners. The next question I have is how does McMaster's strategic plan tie into the academic work of the university? This is a great question um, and a question that I ask regularly and frequently. So first and foremost, what I'd like to say is that the strategic plan has been um, developed so that it really has five priority areas and those are inclusive excellence, teaching and learning, research and scholarship, engaging local, national, global, and Indigenous communities, and operational excellence. And so how the university's academic work ties into each of these is, is very important. So it's, it's not only strategic, it's operational. So when we think about an inclusive excellence, 
excellence, what we want to be thinking about is recognizing diverse ways of knowing in the classroom. It's about diversifying our faculty. And uh, certainly uh, one excellent example of that is our Black Excellence Faculty Cohort Hire. Um, it's about teaching and learning. So the core of our academic work is our students, which is why we've developed the comprehensive teaching and learning strategy, which by the way, I'm very personally excited about. And it's really about dedicated to celebrating successes and continuing to innovate. There's a lot of innovations that we know as professors and instructors that we can bring into the classroom. And it's about providing supports through our existing resources, McPherson, um, all the supports that we have in our departments. It's about sharing best practices. What has worked? What hasn't worked? And how do we really share that knowledge? Uh, research and scholarship. So our McMaster researchers are also educators to the next generation of researchers. Um, of course, uh, many of our uh, graduate students go on to be leading researchers, not only within our own institution, but other institutions. So there's a lot of coaching and mentoring that we need to be doing um, in this space. Um, engaging local, national, global, and Indigenous communities. So we have lots of experiential learning opportunities, both at the undergraduate level that are community engaged, such as City Lab in Hamilton. Um, we have our Indigenous Studies program, which is often engaging with our local Indigenous communities through academic and co-curricular work. So those are just two of many examples I could speak to. Um, operational excellence. So really, this is, this is important. The goal is to really enable our administrative operations of the university to most effectively support the institutional vision and aspiration of our researchers, our scholars, our teachers, and our learners. And so, of course, uh, I work very closely with um, Sahir Fazalat, our new Vice President Finance and Operations, and her team to make sure that we are ensuring that the academic mission is being supported um, by the university administrative activities. Um, you know, I was at another meeting last week and, and, you know, I was hearing about some of the challenges uh, related to, uh, you know, operations. And I think we've come a long way. And the point I want to say is that we hire faculty to be successful at research and teaching. We want our students to come in and have success and not be worried about anything admitted. Administrative. We want our staff to be able to support us in those important areas. So it's it's uh, quite important um, that we actually really look at um, our operational excellence. Um, so those are the main areas. Um, I could talk to you all day about um, the various aspects of the strategic plan, but if you haven't looked at it, I highly encourage you to look at it. And I highly encourage you to think about how you can personally help us achieve our goals as outlined in the strategic plan. So um, I do have another question here. Um, and the question is, why do students need to return to campus for the winter term, especially since the fall term is working so well, it would be easier for international students in particular to learn remotely. And I guess what I want to say is that I do think we have had many lessons learned through the virtual environment. I, I again would reinforce that I'm so impressed at how we have been able to deliver, we, I should say, our faculty and instructors deliver outstanding education remotely. But I really want to say that we want to return to campus to strengthen the sense of community. And that really drives our intellectual curiosity. I think it's inspiring to all our community members, but especially our students and our faculty. It encourages creativity and makes McMaster an exciting and successful university. There's so much value and rich richness added uh, to your learning experience when it's done in person, from interacting with your peers and instructors and building those relationships. Um, and those will support your learning, not only here, but into the future. 
those, those activities and those experiences that you have are lifelong. And they really do put you on a different path. And I, I think a very important path to have been enriched. Our goal throughout the pandemic is to welcome new and returning students back to the campus as soon as possible, um, you know, but obviously that has to be done safely, it has to be done thoughtfully, and it has to be done in accordance with public health guidance and our government protocols. And, you know, it has been challenging because there have been so many changes. So it's been really important that we, again, communicate what we're doing and try our best to be clear about what our mission and goals are. But you know, we do believe it's important that people are on campus and have those, those opportunities. I have another question here. And the question is, is McMaster committed to flexible work arrangements for staff? It feels like we are being rushed back too many days too soon. So uh, what I'd like to say is that, again, we are trying our best to balance several factors. Um, we know it's important that as an institution, we, we have flexible work arrangements. We also know it's important that we deliver on our core mission. And so it is a balance and it is a trying to understand uh, what each department and faculty and each unit needs. Um, each one of those management areas will be determining the appropriate levels of on-site presence for their area. And we will need to expect that, the, that, um, that there will be a transition time required. Um, the other point that I have been raising is that it's still going to be a little bit experimental in the winter semester. So you can try a couple different strategies and see what works best for your unit. So certainly looking to the future, McMaster is evaluating um, learnings from the pandemic and these pilot arrangements uh, throughout the fall to address our employee wellness. Um, McMaster's leadership is asking leaders to be inclusive and, and to have an understanding of staff needs for flexibility, especially um, that has occurred throughout the fall, and really explore new ways of uh, working wherever possible. Um, I'm going to see what other live questions are, are coming in here for me. Um, so I am not seeing any other live questions um, uh, unless someone has another one um, for me here. Let me just see, I have, uh, ah, okay, I do have a live question here. So the question is, what provisions have been or will be put into place to ensure the return to campus, the normalcy, and ensuring that this does not neglect the emotional and mental health of staff? So what I'd like to say is that in the fall of 2020, as the pandemic evolved, um, I had received from the virtual learning task force a request to specifically look at uh, mental health. Um, and you may recall that task force was chaired by Dr. Hurley and Dr. Purry, the Dean of Social Science and the Dean of Engineering. And essentially what was determined very quickly is that given the mandate of the McMaster Okanagan Committee to integrate health and well-being into all aspects of campus life, um, that we needed to have a group specifically look at this. And of course, one of the slides I did cover uh, was really just a tip of the iceberg on the work that is being done in that area. And so, um, so without um, having some of these supports in place, we knew that it was extremely important that we think about what kind of supports did we need at that moment in time, but also into the future. And so um, uh, Dr. O'Byrne and I had asked Dr. Catherine Munn, a member of the Okanagan Committee, 
who is a psychiatrist um, our, uh, here at McMaster. And we actually tasked her and the team to look at um, you know, mental health more broadly. And she had had extensive knowledge, uh, previous knowledge, uh, knowledge and exposure to the McMaster Student Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy within the Student Affairs and was directly involved in the Profes Professor Hippo, uh, which is an on-campus student mental health education program, which really teaches faculty how to identify um, if students are having some mental health issues. Um, and so what's really come out of this is um, an opportunity for us to really look at mental health and well-being um, education about promotion, about supports, and really look at systematic uh, psychological health and safety considerations. And so this small group, um, as I had mentioned earlier, involved 180 stakeholders from across campus. And they really provided um, what I would say strategic input, but also important types of operational input. So we have um, a number of immediate and short-term recommendations that are currently being implemented. And uh, we will continue to um, implement those um, considerations. Um, okay, we do have another question that has just come in here. And the live question is, will staff continue to ha have access to parking closer to on-campus spaces? Will part of um, the, the time passes still, will part-time time passes still be available? And so uh, part-time uh, parking permits uh, were available for the fall term and they're being reassessed for the winter term. More information will be coming soon on the parking website, but it is a consideration that we are looking at and there is a fair bit of uh, thought and effort uh, going into this. So uh, this is also an important um, aspect that we're considering. I'm thinking we probably have time for one more question and I'm just seeing that there's something coming in here. And so I will try to address, address that. Um, and the question is, will there be flexible options for both online and virtual for learning in the upcoming winter semester? And especially for large core requirement courses. And so, uh, so in response to that, um, there were, over the last year, we've really had the opportunity to take advantage of installing various types of equipment. Um, and we do have, uh, especially in a lot of our larger classrooms, the Echo 360 live captioning technologies. And um, this is really for most of our very large registrar controlled classrooms. So 71 of our largest classrooms on campus have been enabled with this technology for winter 2022. And so what this will allow is for our instructors to record their lectures and share them on Avenue to Learn for students to replay later. Um, I would say that this is one of the features that we have received very positive um, input back from our students related to um, being able to access lectures at a later time and to be able to replay those lectures um, as they're studying and uh, reviewing for exams, et cetera. So um, we do plan to have that capacity, the capacity, the infrastructures in place. Uh, we've, we've put a lot of uh, time and energy and resources into ensuring that we have that capacity. And we do think it's also very important as part of our um, ability to deliver high quality uh, curriculum across the board. So I'm getting the cue here that I am coming to an end uh, with the question and answer period. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining me today and asking your questions. Um, I also want to want to take a moment to thank all of you for your dedication to McMaster. We are proud of you and we're proud to, to have you as part of our community. Um, I also wanted to say that I've enjoyed meeting many of you over Zoom calls and at online events. 
I really look forward to meeting you in person. Um, you know, certainly I've really enjoyed being on campus um, over since September. Um, I am coming to campus a few days a week. I love walking across campus and I've really appreciated that many of you have approached me, uh, recognized me from the town halls. And, and that's, that's, that's a sign that yes, the Zoom calls aren't the same, but I'm grateful that at least, um, you know, we've had that opportunity to meet. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank um, all of our event leads. Tina Depko and Robin Obermeyer, um, our technical lead, Dave Dawson, our facilitation staff, Monique Beach, uh, Christine Cashew, and um, Andrea Farquhar uh, for always being so helpful, um, especially on these events. I'd really like to take this opportunity to wish you all uh, a healthy and happy end of the semester and hoping that all of you can take some time over the holidays to recharge and get ready for 2022. I can't wait to see you all on campus and I'll say bye for now. Thank you.